talking to the church. Uh, and we'll look at the third aspect of um, sort of how a spirit-filled Christian, um, and I've tried to make a case to you, there's no other kind. Um, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit resides in you. And Paul's now giving instruction to those who have been chosen by God, redeemed by Christ, and marked by the Holy Spirit. There, there is a way in which those such people ought to live. And one of the things they ought to do as being spirit-filled is they ought to live in the way that God's called them to live in their relationships. We've looked at uh, marital relationships and husbands and wives. We've looked at parental relationships with parents and children uh, last week. And then this week, we'll look at our vocational relationships, um, although it's in uh, a frame, uh, framed in a way in the scriptures, you may think, well, that doesn't apply to me. But as always, I think all of scripture always applies to all of us in some way. And I think there's some principles to be found here um, that we can uh, garner, from, garner the message from, but more importantly, can implement in our own lives and so that we can live in our relationships in the way that God has called us to. But let me start with this, um, this idea of Who's the boss um, may come up a lot, or maybe it doesn't come up that often, but I suspect in your life, just like mine, there are places in which we have to decide who's in charge here and what's going to happen according to the person in charge. And much of our vocational lives um, either consist in how do I be the kind of employee I'm supposed to be or how do I uh, be the kind of boss that I'm supposed to be, and both can be very difficult. So much so that phrases like, uh, it's uh, hard to find good help these days, gets thrown around, mostly because it's probably true. Um, and I think that's always been true. We can go back more than a hundred years, and there was um, a guy named Elbert Hubbard that on February 22nd, 1899, there was a very small article published in um, not a real widely distributed um, piece of literature that kind of caught fire. Now, um, Elbert Hubbard, in fact, I'll put the name that was later published under this title, A Message to Garcia. Um, well, he wrote this article because the publication that he edited himself and wrote much for, he needed some space filled. If you've ever had to do a document you want a whole page, especially when printing was much more difficult and much more costly, you didn't want blank space on something uh, needlessly. So he wrote a small article just kind of venting about his frustrations with different things, and he used um, this example. Um, uh, uh, he says that there was um, a need during the Spanish-American War that President McKinley wanted a message personally delivered to General Garcia that was in the heart of Cuba. Um, and he asked, who could do such a thing? It would be a long and dangerous uh, mission to do that. And it was said that a man by the name of Lieutenant Rowan would be the man for the job. And several people said, if anybody can do it, he can do it. And so he received his orders and very quickly carried them out effectively and diligently. Well, this little small article, in fact, you can look it up uh, yourself today. You can still find a PDF copy of a message to Garcia. But why the popularity of it? In fact, Legend has it, and I read some about this, that maybe it's a little more on the legend than the actual side, but there's no doubt it became a very popular little article. In fact, after it was published in this small publication, they began to get a request for a reprint of just that part of it, which was not unheard of, but not all that common. But he got a request for 10, and then 20, and somebody else requested 100 copies of it. And finally, he got a request for thousands of copies from a man who owned a railroad that wanted every uh, employee of his railroad to read this article. And the gist of it was this, is that we all ought to be people that, given a task, ought to do it diligently, without question, and to carry it out faithfully, loyally, and dutifully. Why is that so popular? In fact, here's the, one of the concluding uh, statements in this little publication, A Message to Garcia. He says, civilization is one long, anxious search for just such individuals, such individuals as Rowan, who's in this story. Any, uh, anything such a man asks will be granted. His kind is so rare that no employer can afford to let him go. 
He is wanted in every city, town, and village, in every office, shop, store, and factory. The world cries out for such. He is needed and needed badly. The man who can carry a message to Garcia. Now, that caught on so much so that uh, famously in the Watergate tapes, um, uh, President Nixon was found saying, I need a man who can carry a message to Garcia. In other words, I need a trusted man. Now, I don't know in that situation if it was for nefarious reasons or not, but it's a thing that people say, I need someone who can be such a man. In fact, there was a time in the early part uh, of the 20th century that uh, phrase, uh, someone who will carry a message of Garcia, was actually in the Boy Scouts of America manual, that people were encouraged to be someone who could carry a message to Garcia. Why is good help hard to find? Why is it hard to find a man who can carry a message to Garcia? We could also ask the question, why are good bosses hard to find? Because if you've been on one side of that, you'll recognize a need on both sides of that. Well, I think the issue that Paul is writing about here, although it's couched in language about slaves and masters, gets at the essence of what it means to be a person of God. Because I believe, as, as do Many people, the traits that make us more like Christ make us more desirable in many ways. Now, I know we live in a society today that doesn't think all that much of Christians all the time and that espousing your Christian beliefs. There was an article this week in the paper about a man uh, who made a statement about his faith in Jesus Christ and how it inf uh, impacted his um, outlook on some moral issues and he was fired from his job. But also I think it's a reality that people want people who are honest and truthful and loyal and sincere and wholehearted in their service. And that's the kind of service that God calls his people to. So how do we get at this? Now let's read um, Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, just as verse 5 to 9, there's um, instructions here, first for slaves and then for masters. Um, and let's see what God's word has to say to us about our service to one another and how this fits in with being a spirit-filled person um, who lives the way God wants us to live. Hear the word of the Lord, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, we'll start with verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And we're going to save not verse 9 for just a minute, but before we go any further, let me just say a word about slavery and why uh, it is a common critique of the Bible that you read things like this and you say, why doesn't the Bible just outright condemn slavery? We live in a time and in a place in the world um, that almost unanimously condemns this kind of thing. Why doesn't the Bible do it here? Well, let's say a couple of things that I think need to be known about when Paul is referencing slavery. What is he referencing? Yes, it was an institution. It's hard for us not to think of slavery in terms of North America slavery in the uh, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries along in there. What a horrible blight on our history. Um, and it's common all around the world in almost all time. But in Paul's day, um, slavery was a little different than that, although it could have some exact parallels in certain places. But in the Roman world during Paul's day, this is hard to imagine, but there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire, and an empire that um, consisted of about 120 million people. So somewhere in the neighborhood of half of all the people who might happen upon this letter would be on one side or the other because if there's 120 uh, or 60 million slaves, there might not be 60 million slave owners, but there must have been a lot. And even in the Roman Empire, slavery was not always, in fact, not often 
uh, what's today called chattel slavery, where one person was literally owned for all eternity by another. Most slavery, people had entered into voluntarily. But even that gets a little sticky as to say, how voluntary is it to have to sell yourself to someone for a certain amount of time in order to not starve to death or in order to make um, ends meet for your family? But also we read in um, current literature about the same time this was written, um, often slaves held places of high honor. They were um, not only like family members, but also had all kinds of rights and often would inherit um, the fortune or at least whatever was passed on when there was no descendants to be there. But that doesn't let us off the hook to say, okay, if there was examples where slavery might not have been so bad, there were plenty, and there were plenty in the Roman Empire. There are people going all the way back to the time of Aristotle that talk about slaves being killed for being disobedient or even for minor things. They were bought and sold, separated from families at a whim of an owner. So is the Bible wrong for not abolishing slavery or not calling directly for the abolishment of such an institution. I want you to know this, that if you've read the whole Bible and you understand Old Testament, New Testament all the way through, the Bible does speak about that. And the things that it speaks about slavery would be radical, revolutionary, and life-changing and counter-cultural to all the, the norms in society at any of those times. For instance, in Israel, back in the Old Testament, um, there were uh, slaves in many households. But you also have to understand that the value of human life was such that God had commanded his people that every seven years all slaves would be released unconditionally. That even in a subtle way that would have been countercultural at the time to say that's not the way people were meant to live. They were not meant to live subservient and owned by another person. In the New Testament, um, in the book of Galatians, this, this same apostle Paul wrote that in Jesus Christ, there was neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. That in the body of Christ, as they were gathered together, no one was looked at as slave or free, that all were free in Jesus Christ. And maybe the most revolutionary thing, and it's almost never mentioned, I did a fair bit of reading about how the church address, uh, addresses slavery uh, historically and even today. And this isn't the first thing that comes up, but there's a small letter, in fact you may have passed over it, may not have ever read it, it fits on one page in your Bible called Philemon. And Philemon is a book that's written to a slave owner by the name of Philemon about a runaway slave named Onesimus. Onesimus was a slave who not only ran away from his uh, master, but stole some things before he ran away. He happened to be in the same place the Apostle Paul was and became a believer in Jesus Christ. And so do you know what Paul says to him and to his owner Philemon? Does he say, you shouldn't have been doing this anyway, you need to go your separate ways? Paul says, no, you need to go back. Um, and Paul does a really radical thing. He tells Philemon not to accept Onesimus back, forgive him for what he's done and let him go back to being your slave. He says, let him come back and receive him as a brother. You see what Paul is saying there? Is that there is a calling in Jesus Christ that's much higher than the things around us. Now I've already said to you, if you've been here the last couple weeks, that our relationships with each other in all kinds of ways are radically changed in Jesus Christ. That in Jesus Christ, that husbands and wives love and respect and treat each other in ways that weren't the normal uh, for Paul's time. That um, wives could be treated similar to be slaves. They could be dismissed and thrown out without any reason given in many situations. And Paul says that should never be. A husband should lay down his life for his wife. He should give himself up just like Jesus has given himself up. And in parental relationships, that fathers don't exasperate their children, they love them, that they wash them with the word, similar to how husbands and wives interact with one another. These relationships are not just made better, they're radically changed, a whole new definition of relating to one another. And so although, yes, Paul uh, addresses slaves and masters because so many people that would have read this letter would have found themselves in these situations. 
And I think it's one of the places in which the Bible speaks to all of us in all places for all times on all subjects. And so not only does it not endorse the institution of slavery, I think if Paul's uh, instructions were to be followed, that institution would have been quickly stood on its head and abolished on its own. The way to abolish slavery, in fact, historically, those who were most effective in the abolition of slavery were those who were believers in Jesus Christ. People like William Wilberforce uh, and others that worked so diligently and tirelessly, not because uh, they wanted to be a do-gooder, but because they believed that that's what the gospel says uh, should uh, affect our lives. That's how we should live our lives. So having said all of that, um, we don't live in a slave society today where people are, it's uh, illegal in our country for one person to own another, but we do live in a time where our relationships with one another often find us under the authority of someone else and we have to say, how do we live in that kind of relationship? In fact, we live in a time where work relationships are often used for dishonest gain, for exploitation, and all kinds of ungodliness. So a word to what I want to say today is to employers and employees. First, to employees, to those who are under the authority of another in your vocational life, just these three things, I'm going to put them all up here at once, is that first and foremost, we are to glorify and obey Christ, and we can do it in these three simple ways. First of all, working respectfully. Notice what verse 5 said there, um, that we do such with fear and respect. That we do it in a way that honors another person. That the Bible's clear that those who are put in positions of power have been put there by God. In fact, in the Old Testament, even wicked, evil rulers and kings, it says God was working out his purpose in them and through them. God's not the author of that evil, but he is working in that. And so if you're here today and go, okay, whatever advice you're going to tell me as an employee, you don't know my boss. Well, I can tell you this, God knows your boss. And if you read your Bible, know that there were all kinds of people. Pick up, pick up the book of Daniel and see what these slaves who were God's people did when asked to do certain tasks. They were willing to obey a master except when it called for them to be disobedient to God. People like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are um, shining examples of how to be in a subservient position but that gives true honor and service to the one who we all serve in God himself through Jesus Christ. So basically what this is saying is to do your work just as you would do it for Christ in no other way. Despite who you are working for, we do it with fear and respect because we have fear and respect for God. We also do our work by glorifying Christ by working wholeheartedly and, sincere, and sincerely. Verse 5 and, and through 7 says again, With sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ, obey them not only when, uh, to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. How many of us know it's really easy to do a good job when the boss is standing there watching, but how hard it is to know when we're unaccounted for in our time. This says serve wholeheartedly as if you are serving the Lord, not people. And I love some of the things that it says. In fact, um, if you have a King James Bible and you're looking at it here, one of those phrases says, not by way of eye service as man pleasers. I like both of those things. Don't give eye service. We don't use that term much anymore. You know what lip service means. Um, that just means I'm going to say it, but I'm not really going to do it. Well, eye service is similar. Don't just do it when someone's watching, or particularly when the boss is watching. You do it even when someone's not watching. And to be a man pleaser is to do it only to garner the favor of those around you. Um, one person says, don't be an apple polisher, always trying to look good for the boss, um, but not really having good intentions. Here's what one person says, Richard Koken says this, and I like the way he puts this. As workers, we are one part of the means by which our loving creator provides for the daily needs of the world, whether we write contracts or computer software or sermons, fix pipes or broken arms or trucks, or wash the family laundry, dirty windows or pots in a restaurant. We worship God when we do it 
for him. That's a radical thing for some people to know, that you can do any of those things in your vocation that you can actually worship God when you do it. No matter what others think of what you do, if you do it for God, it's an act of worship. He goes on to say, for we write, fix, wash to feed the family and to earn money to contribute to the gospel work of our church and to seek opportunities to witness to our fellow workers and get this, and to please the big boss Jesus enthroned in heaven. You know, a lot of us, uh, there's a hierarchy maybe where you work and Always there is, you want to please the one who's at the top the most. Now generally how you do that is to please the one who's most immediately over you. But in the end, who is the boss? Well in the church, um, uh, some of us need to be reminded of this. Deacons aren't the top, elders aren't the top, the pastor's not the top. Who's the tip of the top in the church? It's Jesus Christ. But guess what? Who's the tip of the top in your job? Jesus Christ is still the tip of of the top. He's the big boss. He's always the one we're ultimately working for. And even if you don't or can't please everyone that's in between you and Jesus, our job is to please him first and foremost, and in some cases only him. And we do that by serving wholeheartedly, and we do it when someone's not looking as well as when they are looking. We should have an eagerness that we don't have to be compelled to do our work, our uh, the things that compel us come from our relationship with Jesus Christ. So much so that Paul uses a radical term here. Is He says, even if you're a slave to man, ultimately you are always a slave to Christ. Who would sign up to be a slave? Well, if you understand what it means to be in relationship with Jesus Christ, you have. You have said, my needs will go by the wayside and Christ will be put at the forefront. That I'll serve him first, but only him. And I won't serve myself. I'll put uh, others' needs before mine because that's what Jesus says. Not because it always comes naturally to me. Not because it's always what I want to do. But it's because it, what, it's what pleases Christ. And lastly in that, we do it expectantly. And I won't say a bunch about this, but just listen to what he says in verse 8. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. He says that there is a way in which God has designed the world in which we live in the here and now, but we know that we are storing up for ourselves treasure in heaven, the Bible says elsewhere. There's a way in which everything that I do here, even being obedient, working diligently, wholeheartedly, and sincerely in my vocation, it pleases the Lord, and in doing so, I'm storing up for myself um, a future in heaven. And that's something we should look expectantly to. And there is a sense in which, um, in the uh, horrible reality of actual slavery, many people cling to that idea that one day, I will be free. Because to be free in Jesus Christ is to be free spiritually. That doesn't always work itself out into actual freedom in this life. But there will come a day when I will live in ultimate bliss, happiness, and blessedness in heaven with Jesus Christ. And one of the ways that I show that I'm expecting that is that I live in such a way that reflects that Jesus is the King and the Lord of my life. And then, uh, real quickly as we close... This is what it says to masters. It's much shorter. Uh, I don't think because it's easier. I think there's plenty of uh, wickedness and rebelliousness that wells up in us when we're the one in charge and not uh, the one who has to serve. But he simply says this, And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. God says, You people who are in charge, uh, you work for the same person. In fact, in one way, he says, you're not as much in charge as you think you really are. You also work for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so for all those things that he says, treat your slaves in the same way, if you're the boss, you are to treat your employees with these kinds of things, with respect, that you are also um, to have authority and wholehearted sincerity before the Lord. And that you too should live in an expectant way that you will be called into the, in account for the way in which you treat those uh, who serve under you. 
So the long and short of this message is, whether you're in charge or the one being bossed around, in either way, you belong to Jesus ultimately. And the way in which we respect each other, the way in which we are obedient to one another, the way in which we serve one another reflects that ultimate reality that we belong to Christ and we are answerable first and foremost to Him. So wherever you find yourself today in your vocational life, the same as with your marital life or your parental life is we are accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's the reality of it. Have we failed in that? Have we failed um, as a husband or a wife? Have we failed as a parent or a child? Have we failed as an employee or an employer? Sure you have. We wouldn't be human if we, won't, if we weren't. But don't forget the whole first half of the book of Ephesians says that you were once far away and now you've been brought near. You were once dead and now you've been made alive. And I'll say this to you. If you don't know Jesus Christ, this will sound like an utter impossibility to you. We live in a world that says, I won't show my boss any respect unless he respects me. That's not what Jesus says. Did Jesus show respect only to those who respected him? Did Jesus serve those who only served him? That's not the way of Christ. The way of Christ, Jesus would say to you, take up your cross and follow me. It might come to me to have to actually suffer in this life in order to be obedient to Jesus Christ. Who gets the glory when we do that? Jesus does. The message of the gospel is not try harder and be better. The message of the gospel is um, your best effort and your best try has not been good enough and will not be good enough. You need a radical transformation. That's why if we go back to the middle of chapter 4 when it says be filled with the Holy Spirit, it means you need to trust in Jesus Christ. You need to set aside your own efforts, your own desires. You need to take yourself off of the throne and put Jesus Christ on the throne. That's the only way, not only in our vocation, but our marriages, our families, and every other relationship that exists on this earth. It's only when Jesus is in his proper place can we fulfill our calling in those relationships. Any other way is just asking us to do something that we're not capable of doing. We need faith in Jesus Christ to change us, to make us more like himself. There's a story about... um, an old, older missionary couple who was returning to the United States um, on a ship in the days before planes um, after having served for decades on the mission field. Um, and they didn't, had obviously not made any money, didn't really have any long-term plans when they returned, but their time had come to an end on the mission field. And they ended up on the same ship um, coming across the ocean as Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was returning from a safari on a hunting trip that he was famous for. And so as they were boarding the ship, there was lots of press there. They were taking pictures and lots of crowds gathering around them as they entered the ship. No one noticed this couple. And as they were on the ship, everybody was bending over backwards to be around Teddy Roosevelt to do things for him, to make sure he was well taken care of. Nobody paid them any attention. And the man in this couple began to be discouraged and in his heart he began to think we've been serving the Lord on the missionary for all these decades and all people care about is the person who has power, who has fame, who has fortune. What's in it for me? How come I don't see the same kind of accolades and attention that he does? And as they returned, they uh, returned to New York Harbor and there was a grand parade and a band and confetti, um, lots of pomp and circumstance for Teddy Roosevelt and as he exited the ship, everyone deserted. No one noticed this couple coming away. And as they began to have to look for a place to live that they couldn't afford and having to find jobs now to support themselves, having been on the mission field so long that night, um, this man began to seek, uh, sink into uh, kind of deep bitterness really. And he says to his wife, it just doesn't seem right. Seems like the Lord would do more for us in this homecoming. We ought to have a better homecoming than Teddy Roosevelt. We've done more from the Lord for the Lord than he has done. And his wife, as wives tend to do often, she said, well, why don't you go in the other room and talk to the Lord about it? It's usually good advice from husband or wife. And so he did. And he came out and just a few minutes later and there was a smile on his face. And she said, Well, you look like you're better. And he did. And he said, I am. 
And she said, well, what happened? He said, well, I prayed about and I told the Lord that I wasn't very happy about our homecoming. I thought it ought to be bigger. And he said, the Lord said one very simple thing to me. He said, you're not home yet. What a grand revelation. His whole outlook on everything changes. That wasn't his homecoming. His homecoming will be when the Lord Jesus comes or when he died and went to be with Jesus in heaven. That's when our faith will become sight. That's when the reality of all that God has called us to do, um, that it will come to the reality of this is what Jesus has called us to do. This is what Jesus has called us to be. And all those times when we've had to serve when we really wanted to be served, when we showed respect when we really didn't want to, when we loved when we really wanted to be angry, that's when that faith will become a reality and we'll see that our Lord Jesus Christ has done the same for us. And our faith will be met with reward of eternal life in heaven. So I'll remind you today, if this seems difficult, if it seems difficult to be respectful, wholehearted, sincere, and expectant in our life, just know that this world's not your home and there will come a day when we'll get to go and be at home with the Father. Can we pray together? Our Heavenly Father, it is with great joy that we acknowledge that we are children of God, that you've prepared a place for us with you. Uh, but we also are thankful that you've not left us to ourselves until that time, that you've given us your Holy Spirit to live in us, uh, that you actually uh, have given us opportunity to set aside that old nature, uh, that part of us that uh, wants to be selfish and look out only for ourselves, and that we can serve in our marriages, in our families, in our jobs, in all those places. Our relationships can be radically different because Jesus is radically different. I pray that we would seek uh, freedom and justice and righteousness in all parts of society. That the wickedness and evil of, of things like slavery one day could be ended here on earth. But until that day, let us serve in the place that you've given us. Let us love in the way that Jesus has loved. Give us eyes of faith to endure, uh, to persevere, uh, and to... Uh, faith that will see us through until the end. We know that that only happens by your word and by your spirit that resides in us. And so we ask you for that today and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen.